let me cite my inner Monty Python. Uh, and now for something completely different. We're going to do something, in fact, quite different and move. I'm not going to speak specifically about missions. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of, of research and, to some extent, the kind of delivery. How do we know what we think we know? And, and are there other ways that we can share the information that we uncover very quickly to the general public, uh, to teachers and students? So I'm going to outline uh, as well a project, an initiative at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, and I hope I can corral my fellow panelists into joining this project. So let me begin, again, just thanking all the organizers. And, and I'd like to thank a couple of my graduate students, uh, Rachel Sanderson and Hannah Tweet, and uh, Trevor Bryant, uh, who have been working on this project with me now for a, a couple of years. And it's a project that, that's built out of what's been going on, certainly in Spain, for many decades. And that is to digitize records. Uh, this site, for example, Pares, is a site that houses hundreds of thousands of pages of original documents, original photographs, documents that date back from medieval Spain all the way through to the 20th century, from a number of state archives, including the most important state archive related to Florida history, and that's the archive of the Indies in Seville. Uh, they started this, they've been working on this project in Spain now for, gosh, almost certainly more than 30 years. And Spain really was a pioneer in digitizing records. I, I think what they decided, though, was that they were going to create a website that is so unbelievably difficult to navigate that, that nobody can find a document. And, and they succeeded. It, it's quite magnificent how, how that's been done. But it has all kinds of records on it that, uh, like I said, are digitized and accessible. What you see before you is an example of one of the letters written by, I think I mentioned this letter earlier this morning, uh, a letter signed by Doña Maria Casica, chief. And she was the female chief at Nombre de Dios Mission. Uh, this is a letter she wrote to the King of Spain in, in February of 1600 not really accessible, uh, not translated yet, certainly not in any textbooks. I promise you, if this name said Pocahontas, it would be in every textbook in the state, a translation of this letter. And so the idea behind the project that we're working on is to make some of this material more accessible and deliver it through uh, digital history. The idea for the missions and I'm going to come back to this uh, a couple of times as we talk about it this morning. But the idea is to digitize not just mission records, but the whole process of missionization in Florida. And I think this will make more sense as I go through uh, the kind of material that we've already done. The first project that really got this initiative underway was a project we started uh, when I was at the University of North Florida uh, back in about 2010-2011. And the idea was to digitize all of the parish records in St. Augustine, Florida. 6,000 pages of parish records. These are records that date back to 1594. Uh, they're the oldest written documents in the United States about a region in the United States, older than anything you'd find at the National Archives. And they date back to 1594. And so this was the first project we did in collaboration with Vanderbilt University. Uh, Jane Landers, this is Jane Landers here. Uh, if you've been reading some of the stories about digitization projects in Cuba, uh, this is David Lefevre, uh, who's been leading that process of digitizing a lot of these records now in Cuban archives, endangered records, uh, many of which deal, uh, deal with, uh, with slave populations. And uh, my two students and, and this team from Vanderbilt came down and trained them. And then uh, Saber Gray and Arthur Taratis spent the better part of a year, every weekend, traveling from St. Petersburg to, to St. Augustine, uh, digitizing these records. And they include things like the first recorded baptism of anybody of African descent in the continental United States that we have. Uh, this record dates to, to 1595. But they also contain a lot of records that look like this. 
And so when we were going through them one day, I was looking at a book of 17th century baptisms, and somebody in his infinite wisdom took a black marker and wrote the year on the document with a question mark. Uh, of course, this handwriting here is not 17th century, it's 18th century text. And the first word that jumped out at me, it's the front page of a book of baptisms. And the first word I saw was this word right here, Diablo, devil. I said, why, does somebody write, why is somebody writing the word devil on the first page of a book of 17th century baptisms? And uh, I teach a program at the University of South Florida uh, in 16th century Spanish paleography, how to read 16th century Spanish handwriting. I'm seeing the looks. Uh, I mean, you heard the governor this morning who said that uh, 16th century paleography was now a critical skill for all Florida. <laughs> I have this dream, uh, recurring dream that he says that. In any case, this is what I start my Spanish paleography class. Uh, they all come in, I close the door and lock the door, and then... <laughs> And then uh, I read them this. I said, what this priest, it was likely a priest in the 18th century who looked at this book of 17th century baptisms, uh, baptisms and he said, my dear Lord, not even the devil could read this. The writing is so bad I can't make out a single word in it. And I tell them, stick with me for eight months, you're gonna learn a skill that the devil himself does not possess. And that excites them because they say, okay, uh, one on you, Satan. I'm going to learn how to read this stuff uh, that you can't read. Uh, and then, of course, I take students with me in the summer to Seville, Spain. And we conduct archival research related to uh, topics in 16th through uh, early 19th century Florida history. And they work really in the most important archival repository for Florida, which is the Archive of the Indies in Seville. Stunning building. It, it used to be able to research in, in this building, and now they've moved us across the street to something a little less elegant. But this is below this building is where all of the documents are housed. And just to give you a sense of the scale, John and I could work in that archive for the next 40 years, it, all day, every day, drinking Fountain of Youth water, uh, and we still would not cover all of the material just on Florida just to give you a sense of the scale of the material. Now imagine Mexico and Peru, places that were the core of empire. Uh, so when people ask, do you think you'll find something new? Absolutely, the, without a doubt. Uh, and not just in this archive, but in dozens and dozens of archives around the world. They're happier at the end of the day, the students uh, at the end of the day in, in the archive. So what we're doing is we're gonna build the uh, Colonial Center for Digital History. And I'm gonna explain a little bit what we plan to build uh, in the initial phases of this project and then how the mission uh, stories can be folded into what we're building. Uh, we already have established some, uh, I think, quite important partnerships with the uh, Museum of, of America in Madrid and the uh, Museum of the, of the Army in Toledo and the Naval Museum in Madrid. We're working really most closely, oh, it's not on the list, uh, with, the with uh, an organization in Malaga, uh, the University of Malaga, and another organization called the Instituto Nauta in uh, Malaga, and we hope to build these uh, uh, partnerships uh, with some other institutions. And the goal, of course, is to promote innovative new scholarship, and in some ways to get Florida's narrative into a national narrative and into a global narrative, where it belongs uh, in terms of uh, Florida's early history. Uh, interdisciplinary. We want to develop web-based learning material, and, and of course, the research opportunities for students and faculty, I think, are uh, pretty extensive. Why digital? I, I'm a bit of a digital skeptic, uh, to be honest, but I think there's some real advantages to doing this in a digital format, and, and I'm going to outline uh, why I think that's the case. The model initially was based in part on what is probably the most successful digital history site in the state, uh, in the country, and that's the University of Virginia's Center for Digital History. But it's a site that I think is, is serves 
scholars and advanced undergraduate students better than it serves the general public. And I didn't want to create a site that was simply taking a bunch of documents and maps and putting them online and saying, all right, learn how to read this stuff that the devil himself doesn't know how to read. Uh, this will help you. Uh, and we wanted to go beyond that. So the first projects, we're going to launch this in the fall. And the first projects, really the most extensive project, and I know you're all delighted because I see your faces, finally somebody's going to talk about prosopography. I've been waiting uh, since the whole conference started for someone to, to talk about prosopography. Prosopography, very simply, is the study of collective biography. Taking a set of people. So if you were to ask, for example, what did the typical conquistador who came to Florida with Pedro Menendez de Aviles, what could you say about them in terms of their ages, where they were from, marital status, education background? What do we know? And right now, we don't know that much. We know that there were lots of them, uh, but we couldn't give you that kind of background. And uh, that, this fall, I promise you, is going to change. We now have uh, more than, I think, 840 people registered who went with, came with Hernando de Soto in 1539 to 43, where they were from and the names of everybody who went on that expedition. We have almost 650 of the people who went with Pedro Menendez Aviles in 1565. Sancho the Archiniega expedition, not a well-known expedition. It's not, there, there isn't a single monograph just on the Sancho the Archiniega expedition. This was one of the largest expeditions to come to Florida uh, in the entire colonial period. Almost 2,000 people. In fact, by the time we finish, there will probably be more than 2,000 people who came with uh, Sancho the Archiniega. We've identified 1,833 of them. Uh, when the Spanish captured the French Fort Caroline, they occupied that fort until 1568. We have everybody who lived on uh, at that, all the Spaniards uh, who lived at that site. We have almost 500 people who lived on Paris Island, South Carolina, between 1566 and 1587. And then we catch up to the diocesan records. So already, we probably have the single largest database of people for any region in Latin America. And right now, uh, I guess uh, my list is, is probably, it's certainly more than 10,000 people uh, on that list, and it's growing, and if John plays, it'll grow a lot more quickly. Uh, and that prosopography is loosely based on really the one prosopography site that I'm sure you've all visited, uh, and that's the prosopography of Anglo-Saxon England. And the idea was to create a database of everybody who lived in Anglo-Saxon England. It, too, has some value, but that value is also limited. We want to make this material a little bit more accessible to users. So I'm going to use just the Sancho, the Archiniega evidence uh, to give you an idea of what the plan is. Sancho the Archiniega was one of the many uh, Basques uh, who came to Florida in the colonial period. He was from Portugalete. And as I said before, we've identified uh, 1,833 people. We know the place of origin for 84% of those people now. 1,458 from Spain, 885 from outside of Spain. We know the regional breakdown if you put them in the, in the uh, modern or present day comunidades autonomas. Uh, we can break them down by region. So when you look at a, a map of present day Spain, you see that, again, the bulk of the people who came to Florida with the Archiniega expedition were from Andalusia. Uh, but quite a few Gallegos and people from País Vasco, and something that we haven't been able to do before, because now we have the places where they were from, we can start looking in parish archives in places like Zamora and Jerez de la Frontera with the names of the people we have to start thinking about why did people come to Florida in the first place? What do we know about the families? What do we know about their backgrounds? What do we know about their occupations? And, uh, and uh, until now, we haven't really been able to do that uh, because uh, we didn't have this database. Again, uh, the regions, uh, Andalusia, of course, dominating with the Archiniega expedition. We often don't think of the Portuguese in 
early Florida history. And there were Portuguese on all of these early expeditions and quite a number of Portuguese. And so with Artiniega, right now we're at 61 so far from Portugal, some Italians, French, North Africans. If you were to look at a map of the folks who came to Florida, not just with Artiniega, but it looks very similar when you look at Menendez and when you look at Soto, you have Greeks and Italians, people from throughout the Mediterranean world, what becomes Germany, uh, Flanders, France, obviously the Portuguese and North Africans, and then Sub-Saharan Africans as well uh, coming to these. One of the things that was so striking to me when we put the data together was that there are 665 different towns listed. In other words, almost a third of the people were really the only individual from that particular town. We often think of these companies as people coming from the same place, a large group coming from one place, a large group coming from someplace else. And so now we can start to piece together some of these early networks. The idea here is to do exactly the same thing with every single friar who served in Florida in the colonial period. Where were they from? How old were they? Where were they trained in Spain? Which, which convent? Uh, what do we know about their ages? What do we know about how long they served in Florida? Uh, that will be part of the prosopography section when we finish. We've identified 52 different occupations. Uh, there were 20 musicians on that expedition, seven priests, uh, professional fishermen. I'm not quite sure how a guy from Toledo or a guy from Cordoba becomes a professional fisherman, but they were two of the, the other people make sense. Uh, but uh, these were individuals who were technically soldiers, but they didn't do any soldiering. These were guys who were professional fishermen for uh, the community in St. Augustine. The professional barbers, and barbers did, they didn't just cut hair. Barbers did minor surgery, anything that really required intervention with a knife. Uh, there was one a uh, trained surgeon in St. Augustine, and everything else was done by barbers. And <clears throat> carpenters, and now we know the names. We, we can start to piece together who's building the garrisons, uh, who's doing the work in the city, where are they from. Uh, the literacy rates, now right now of course we don't, we only have uh, I guess just over 200 people we've identified literacy rates uh, for these individuals, but already the story that's emerging here is a little bit different from the sense you get from some of the literature which gives the impression that the dregs of society came to Florida. It was people who had no other options, not educated, and, and what's emerging really is a, a picture that isn't all that different when you look at New Spain or Peru. It's kind of a middling lot. A lot of people who know how to sign their name, a surprising number who are uh, literate, and, uh, and of course, uh, these are just the, the signature plus. This is when you find a copy of a document. It's not an original, and it says that this person signed his name. So you know the person can sign the name, but you don't know if they're fully literate or not. This was also striking. I realized when, when we put this table together that the people who effectively colonized Florida are my students. <laughs> you know, when you look at average ages, and, and I'm sure there were more in the 13 to 16 category. Uh, they're harder to find in the documents, but again, I suspect this age average age is going to stay pretty close to 21 or 22. These are the folks who colonize Florida. Uh, and then of course we know we have a list, a, a rations list from people, those who are, the, the information I just gave you were people who left with Archiniega. Uh, this is a list of people we definitely have in Florida in 1566, 1567, and we've identified the origin of 94% of, of those people. Again, the breakdown. So on the site, you'll be able to identify who are all the people from Andalusia, from Castilla-La Mancha, the towns, uh, where they're from again, you know, places like Ciudad Rodrigo. These are going to open up avenues for more investigation uh, that we hadn't really thought about before. Uh, that average age goes up slightly. Uh, and then what we do have as well in that Junco list are the very first births of people of European descent in St. Augustine. Uh, some of them, uh, there appears to be a young girl who's born at the end of 1565. 
uh, before. Uh, we often give credit to a guy by the name of Martinico de Argüelles as being the first recorded European born in, in Florida. And I, I think she was born a few months uh, before he was born. And then, of course, we have the names of the priests and some of the ages of the priests. He's a fascinating figure who gets into all kinds of trouble in Florida, and then he mysteriously drowns. Uh, I'm not sure I believe that story, but, uh, but all the priests, and then, of course, as we follow uh, the friars, we're, gonna, uh, we're going to add more of this information for those uh, Jesuits and Franciscans, but all the names of these priests who serve. And we also have physical descriptions for about 400 people. This is unheard of. Uh, from many places in the Americas, you don't have these kinds of descriptions. So you have, for example, a guy by the name of Pedro de Alenda, who's from Cordoba, 18. How would you like to be him going to get your papers, your license? Well, he's tall, dark, and handsome. Uh, two scars on his face and his forehead. This was the passport of the 16th century. This was the document that proved you were who you said you were. So they often look for things that distinguish. You know, I don't know how effective this is going to be long term or after a really difficult few years. You might not be so handsome anymore and you can say, well, is this really you? You have the scars. We know that people sold these licenses under the table in, in bars in, in Seville and other places. You know, somebody who would be tall, uh, dark and relatively handsome and they're drinking with Pedro and Pedro says, you want to go to Florida? He says, sure. Okay, you're missing a couple of scars, so uh, hold my beer and brace yourself, and you can be me uh, on the next expedition. You feel badly for the next guy in line, round and fat with a big nose, uh, poor Antonio Garcia from Castilla y Leon. But then you get other descriptions, so this Portuguese gentleman, medium build, black beard and dark, one eye and a scar next to his left eye from a knife wound. And this other individual from Asturias, which is quite, I, I find quite striking. I, I try to follow uh, references to disease wherever I find them. Tall pockmarked face and a scar on the third finger of his left hand. There are only about five people who have any physical signs of having survived a, a smallpox epidemic. They, I, I thought there would be dozens. And uh, they, there aren't very many in, in the documents, about five. The other thing that we hope to build, and this is going to start just as a, as a section on the site, on the center site for children, uh, visiting St. Augustine and other colonial sites, how would you write your name in 16th century Spanish? So they can go through the letters and they can put their names together and create name tags. Eventually the idea is that the technical team in Malaga is going to build software to recognize 16th century script. And eventually the plan is that they will have enough of a database that they can work through 16th century script and the abbreviations and all of the various letters, etc. I'm still doubtful that they can do this. They insist that they can. So we'll see how that plays out. I'm happy with children's name tags for now uh, and other ways of, of uh, putting these letters together. The other part that we'll be ready to launch will be a section that will deal with maps. So instead of just putting up a map of Florida or the Gulf, which is, yes, yeah, sure, it's valuable, but how do most people then, what do most people do with the writing? So we're going to animate most of these maps so that you can, anybody looking at this would then be able to see the Spanish transcription and the English translation. Uh, it'll be animated in a much more sophisticated way than this, of course, but that's what we're going to do. Uh, and we hope to do a project, this is not for this next year, but to take the Hernando de Soto expedition and overlay that expedition on this map which dates to 1544. It is colloquially referred to as the Soto map, and it has wonderful information. It's really, uh, John, as far as I know, it's the only 16th century map that labels Native American towns. I don't know of another one from the 16th century that has Tuscaloosa and Mabila, and all of these are native towns, plus sources for salt, uh, fresh water, etc. And then if you just had the regular map, you'd miss some Wonderful details. Over here, there's some text, and it says, Desde Quevira hasta aquí hay grandísimas manadas de vacas. From Quevira in New Mexico to this point, there are great herds of cattle. 
1544? Yes, they're talking about buffalo. And of course, the Spanish do this. This is, happens with linguistic exchange on both sides, that Spanish look for things familiar in the unusual, and they name it after that. And Spanish simply refer to buffalo as hairy cows. They're cows, but they're different. Uh, they're hairy. They're delicious. Uh, this, and the Native Americans do the same thing. So in Mexico, for example, the horse becomes the Castilian deer. It's a deer, but it's not like our deer. It's a deer from Castile. And we see this with, uh, with uh, noun exchanges all the time. We also plan to do a digital recreation of St. Augustine. You heard a lot about the evacuation, and there's so much wonderful material about the evacuation out of West Florida and out of east, uh, the eastern part of Florida. And one of the maps that was commissioned when the Spanish uh, surrendered Florida to the British and evacuated Florida. One of the wonderful sources that appeared after that was a map that was commissioned by the Crown to outline every single piece of property within the walled city of, of St. Augustine and some of the properties outside of the walled city. Who owned the property? What size was the lot? What was the building built with in terms of material? Uh, and so what we, what we hope to do is a digital three-dimension recreation of St. Augustine on the eve of evacuation. So you have things, you can go block by block that it lists the property, what the material was, and in Vadas, the size of the property by block so that students who visit St. Augustine can have an application on an, on an iPhone or an iPad and get information that frankly, you just don't hear as a visitor uh, going to uh, St. Augustine. We know that uh, 3,096 people evacuated St. Augustine, including the 89 uh, Native Americans uh, who left uh, Florida at that time. We have the names of every single person who evacuated. Every single person who left in seven, late 1763, early 1764. We know from the baptism record that the city was made up of people who came uh, run runaway slaves from as far north as New York and Philadelphia. One from Virginia, most obviously from the Carolinas, but people from Cuba and Mexico and one person from Roatan. We know the ethnic break breakdown of a number of the people of African descent number of people who were uh, from Congo, Angola, the Mandinga, etc., with the names of these people, and that will all be part of this database. This image that you see before you, the circles represent properties in 1763 that were owned by women. Yay! Yay. <laughs> And so we have the names of all the female property owners. A third of the properties in St. Augustine were owned by women in 1763. And so we, again, uh, that's the kind of material that will go in there. These are the confirmed properties within the walled city owned by free blacks. There are probably, there, there's at least one more. There might be five or six others. The problem is uh, that person shares a name with a European, so we're not quite sure if uh, we're talking about a free, uh, a black, or we're talking about uh, a European. Those, these two properties were owned by Native Americans. And this one, right on King Street, I mean, this is a prime piece of real estate in 1763, and it was owned by a chief uh, named Juan Sanchez. Uh, the building composition material, uh, we know that almost 70% of the buildings in St. Augustine were built out of tabby or coquina stone. And so again, that will form part of this reconstruction. And then we're doing some video stories based on these maps uh, the first one that we've done, I, I didn't bring it because it's about five minutes long and I thought it would extend beyond my period and, and Teresa would throw something at me. Uh, but we've done a digital story about a guy who came to Florida in 1565 with Pedro Menendez de Aviles. Uh, his, his name was Miguel Mora. Any of you know that name or have you heard of the name Miguel Mora? Well, this region down in the south here, before it becomes Boca Raton, it was known to cartographers and mariners as the Bocas de Miguel Mora, 
the mouths of Miguel Mora. And I always wondered, who was this guy? And why does he get this region named after him? And it survives for all this time. And last summer, I found him. Uh, well, I didn't find him, really, because he, he's dead. But, but I found his story. And he came to Florida in 1565. He participated in the attack on Fort Caroline, expelled the French. He ends up, you heard uh, Gerald talking earlier about the band of Spaniards who end up in Tequesta. He ends up in Tequesta as a captive for 10 months. And then he tells us the, that he escaped Tequesta, and he was stationed in Carlos. Lived in Carlos, and then he spent a little bit of time in Tocobaga, and then he went back to Tequesta, where he spent another uh, eight or nine months until the Tequesta settlement was abandoned, and then he returned to Spain, and then went to Peru, where he spent uh, the rest of his life. Uh, he gets this region named after him. And they continue to name it after him. And of course, then you have these wonderful representations. I love this perfect circle. This is a map that dates to about 1605, uh, two years before Jamestown. And the whole purpose of the map was that the crown, the new king, Philip III and his advisors, wanted to move the St. Augustine garrison to the Miami area. They said, we're sick of you people complaining, and we're going to move you to this area around Miami. And then all of a sudden, all the folks in St. Augustine said, oh, no, no, it's not that bad here. Uh, we, we quite like it here. And it's going to cost you a lot of money to compensate us for our losses. And ultimately, they don't move them. They, they stay. Uh, in part because in, uh, two years later, a, a small band of English ne'er-do-wells arrive at a place called Jamestown. And they decide, just stay where you are and keep an eye on those uh, English characters farther to the north. Uh, and so we did a video animation of this map telling the Miguel Mora story. So the idea is to populate the center site with dozens of stories, video tales of characters who are not particularly well known, men, women of different ethnic backgrounds uh, that will give a window into this early Florida uh, history. So the next phase, uh, and I'll finish it for phase two, uh, the idea is to digitize a Florida mission trail. And one of the things that you'll see when you look at maps of the Franciscan missions, and you heard a number of, of, of our speakers today say, well, we're not quite sure if this was here at this point or was here at the other point or whether this was a mission or a visita. The idea is to start to create a digital mission tour with digital reconstructions where we can do them, with artifacts, images, high resolution images from different uh, mission sites that people can go and then will be very quick to respond where there are, when there are new discoveries, when there's information that can be changed, we'll, we can adjust that very, very quickly, uh, which you can't do in a published account. In a published account, it's there. You have to do a new edition or uh, just say, yeah, I didn't quite get that right. We have more information. We're going to add that to it. So it would be nice to have for anybody with email, with internet access, uh, the availability to go and see what have archaeologists done on this site or on this site and see images and, and look at that kind of interactive map. And then to do digital reconstructions. And we hope to work with a team out of the University of Michigan and, and Tulane to do a re digital reconstruction of one of the Spanish forts in North Carolina. Uh, that was there in 1568, and they want to do, they've done a lot of archaeological work, and they want to do a digital recreation of that site. So that will be part of uh, this second phase. Uh, we received a uh, first major uh, donation, so we're good to go on this project, I think, for the next five years. And we'll see where we go after that, if we can raise some more funds and get some more part partners on board. The idea is to create a model for digital history and digital archaeology that is unlike anything else that's been done. And aim big, go high, and put Florida on a global scale. So thank you. We have time for a couple of questions, if anybody has. Oh. Hang, hang on, Carolyn. No, well, we got to record. We got to record. Next one's in language. 
No, I just, this is so exciting. I'm, I'm not a professional anything, just a lover of history. But is this going to be ultimately, or is there anything now available to the general public for us to do research and, and September. Review? Great. Thank you. September, we're going to launch the first part of the prosopography, which is going to be the Archiniega. And they're, I'll tell you, they're so excited about this in Spain because there are a lot of Spaniards who don't know much about Spain's presence in Florida. And with all these names now, people can start to do genealogical work that they can't do now. None of this stuff is on Ancestry.com, and it's not at the Mormon archives either. It's from scattered material. To put the, the stuff that we put together, that's about eight years of... Give us myheritage.com. Well, I'm, no, my, the, my whole philosophy is this stuff needs to be free. And, and so uh, I did not want to sell it to anybody. Uh, I wanted to get the, the fun to, to share it. So we do not plan to have subscriptions or anything of that nature. This will be free which has upset some people, but oh well. Do we have any other questions? Oh, Nancy. Hang on. Yeah, I guess when you're talking about digitizing the um, history and it gives you the option to update as we learn as opposed to having, uh, you know, published documents that are, you know, some of the stuff I have, I'm reading, it's 30 years old and you know, I go by, you know, what I've learned 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, my question is, as, as, as archaeologists are doing research and they're funded by various grants or fair, various um, uh, funding sources, do you find that most archaeologists are willing to publish and willing to share? I mean, I know, that, I know there's certain, you know, grants where they're required to publish or required to, you know, show some th yeah. stuff public, right. some information public, but is that... I mean, wh where's the challenge in that? I guess that's my, my question. Let's ask the archaeologist. No, uh, I think uh, you raise such a good point. And, you know, you th take a database like that, uh, there'd be no point publishing that, honestly. It's organic. It will continue to change. And I don't know who would buy that book, to be honest. <laughs> the, the Sancho de Archiniega prosopography uh, book. Uh, first of all, secondly, I have no idea who would publish it. Uh, and so I wanted it to be organic. As far as other archaeologists uh, contributing to it, I think that really it's, it's two different methods of delivery. I, I don't think one excludes the other. I, I think, to me, this is not something that replaces the book or the professional article or the field report. It finds a way to deliver fascinating material and use technology to enhance that uh, I don't see what would be wrong with putting together high-resolution images of things. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think that there'd be a lot of archaeologists, if, if we could find ways to fund the digital reconstructions of places, and it's inexpensive, who wouldn't, I don't know who wouldn't want that. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm overly naive. Uh, I asked John last night, I, I have a proposal for him today, and, and for him to tell me the truth, whether he would participate, but he's keeping a list of all the people who went with Luna. That, to me, works beautifully on, on this site. And, you know, I think the only way this is successful is if a lot of people decide that they want to put stuff on there. And so the idea is to create an editorial board, everything will be vetted, and it will be, it'll be like a publication. It's a digital publication. And I think different material we can put on this site that, w that wouldn't go. I've learned long enough working with students that they don't read the appendices. <laughs> when you add appendices with inventories of things and all that, they look at that and say, oh, great, I finished the book. I don't need to read that part of the book. And, and so we can find ways to keep that in. With the Archiniega expedition, for example, I found the, the menu, daily menu from the expedition from the day they leave from Seville to the time they arrive in Florida. We know what they're eating every day. We know that they're, what their rations are. Uh, you know, you think of a teacher who teaches nutrition. 
could take that information and say, how did these expeditions with all these chickpeas and wine, and uh, how did they differ from the kinds of things English mariners drank and ate? And what does that mean long term in terms of uh, nutrition? Uh, you know, there are things I, I think that as it grows will expand and attract not just historians, not just archaeologists, but bring this into a global uh, sphere. And, and lots of people are interested in art and beads and, and I mean, almost digital humanities and video games. Uh, that's the idea. It's, it's quite ambitious, but we're aiming high. Thank you. Thank you.